Okay, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome. Uh, this is their first ever uh, Community Continuity Task Force meeting. Before we get started, I just want to say thank you so much uh, for participating. Um, this is a unique time um, and obviously a historic time. You know, I, we wanted to make sure that we invited the key stakeholders in the community. We did a business resiliency task force meeting yesterday. <clears throat> and, but this is the community continuity task force. And uh, we wanted to make sure that the folks that are doing, you know, the front level service, um, you know, non-business non related for the most part, uh, but, you know, healthcare, you know, from all aspects of life in federal way. Um, I think it'd be instructive to uh, do some brief introductions and uh, let everybody say, you know, uh, hello, what organization they're representing and um, maybe, you know, a quick fact or, or an interesting thing about, you know, how your organization is dealing with them. We've got quite a number of people um, on board, so we, we do want to go fairly uh, quickly. We got up to 36 now. Um, wow. So, but let's go ahead. Let's do some introductions so everybody knows who we are. And and uh, one of the when we were going through the business task force meeting yesterday, um, we did have some delays with people, act, you know, activating their um, or deactivating their mute button. So you may just want to get that handy because um, uh, I'll be calling on uh, I'll be calling on you. And as uh, the our former our current educator and uh, communicator uh, educator in chief, uh, Dr. Campbell knows. Uh, there is a quiz in a few minutes. So, um, okay, uh, actually, let's start with Dr. Campbell. Doctor, um, uh, tell us a little bit about what's going on. So first of all, thank you for the invitation and for anticipating the need for us to collaborate this way, Mayor Farrell. Thank you. Uh, as you know, we are in remote status, meaning our students are getting their education in a remote environment. So, um, working for graduation, alternative options for them, specifically a parade uh, that's doing a uh, walk, sort of a walk in front of the schools where we're taking pictures of them and integrate that the graduation ceremony. So um, I think someone's not muted. I don't think it's me. I can hear some background noise. Um, I would just say that we are relying on our parents right now like we've never had before. And I'm sure, Mayor Farrell, you can attest to the teaching that you're having to do to partner with what's happening at school. The, the big thing on the horizon for us is what will it look like in the fall? And we've been told by everybody that it will not be a traditional start of school. So I'm currently sitting on a statewide committee at OSPI where we're framing up what this is going to look like in the fall. Maybe through a venue like this, I can share what that, how that will play out uh, when we come back. Mayor, on your... Sorry. I did want to talk about... Thank you. Um, I want to talk about this is a great forum with which to share this in kind of information. And once we get done with this first meeting, we're all going to be on a, a big block email. It's going to be a great opportunity to be able to get the word out with a lot of different organizations. Um, with that, uh, Randy, uh, thank you, Doctor. Uh, Randy, welcome. Hi, I'm, I'm Dr. Randy Nordstrom. I'm representing um, the Federway Corral. I'm also a veterinarian in Federway for about 24 years now and a business owner. Um, when it comes to what we're doing, we're obviously we had to cancel concerts, cancel some fundraisers. Um, we're in the process of we, uh, there's a virtual choir company that we're working with to get some online content. So at least we're putting something out for people um, to listen to and to kind of keep our name in the in people's thoughts we're also you know trying to find a way to ensure we can get some practice in so that as soon as everything's lifted and people can start getting out in the community again that we can go out and typically we perform at the performing arts center so we can perform at the performing arts entertainment or event center um, as soon as it's safe to do so um, the hard part is there's a lag time between when things are open and when we can be ready because we have to practice music for typically eight to 12 weeks to be ready for the next concert. So we're kind of trying to leverage every opportunity we can to find a place to practice as soon as that's open. Um, you know, basically we, at this point it's fundraising's online and uh, you know, 
other than that, we're just kind of hanging on until we get the word go. That's great. All right. Thank you. I think great to have you, doctor. All right, Estella, thanks for joining us. Mute. Thank you. I just had to get myself off mute. So I'm Estella Ortega. I'm the executive director of El Centro de la Raza, and we um, opened up our building on January 1st for services to um, obviously families, individuals in Federal Way and South County. And um, <clears throat> our building is on lockdown um, and our staff are working remotely and still providing services because they have their office phones forwarded to their cell phone so they don't miss calls from people. The greatest need obviously is food and rental assistance. And so we have been providing um, that, that service to individuals and we're fortunate to be able to be receiving quite a bit of assistance from foundations, banks, individuals to help uh, people. And the greatest um, sort of challenge there is, you know, getting the food cards, getting people to, you know, provide identification, um, sign that they've received um, whatever we're giving them, um, and limiting that one-on-one -on -one contact with our staff so that we're protecting them at the same time. And so that, that's it in a nutshell. Great, thank you. Thank you, Estella. Okay, uh, Cindy Dusic uh, with Rotary. Um, <clears throat> yeah, Cindy Dusic from the Federal Way Mirror. First, I'll do a little spoil on that. Um, we are very happy to be um, coming out of suspended print uh, for the May 29th edition. And when the Mirror prints then, we will be going back to the broadsheet, which is a, a much um, bigger, uh, I say just take our paper and read it like a Playboy, and then <laughs> that's how big it will be. Um, so it's going to be more ad space, more editorial space, which is we're very, very excited about. Our but read it for the stories, right? Not the pictures. Absolutely right. That's absolutely <laughs> right. <laughs> but you better be reading the ads, too. We want that. Um, <laughs> the digital presence uh, was just huge during um, this COVID time. We have been, we are the largest digital paper uh, in our family anyway, but it's just really exploded. As far as Rotary goes, we are having Zoom meetings every week um, and we're kind of operating as per normal, trying just to keep in touch with each other. We don't have, a, we have very limited kind of funds, but we were able to donate originally $7,000 to help uh, feed schools. Half of it went to communities and schools and half of it um, Dr. Campbell's organization touched, it put us in touch with um, the faith-based organizations so that we could donate through them. Um, right. And since then, we've also had another $2,000 <clears throat> donation to uh, communities and schools for helping with lunches. So uh, we're just trying to rally on and stay connected and be important to the community. Very good, thank you. Okay, uh, Catrice, you just say hi and uh, the organization you're with. Uh -oh. Hi, everybody. So I'm Catrice Dennis, and my organization is Teaching with Love and Care. And I have a learning center where I focus on the development of the human spirit in our children and their families. So and I'm That's just great. working on just trying to figure out my online platform so I can still be in communication with my family. Thank right. you. You got a little, got a little coworker there, too. Yes, I do. She goes with me <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Okay, thank you. Uh, Robin, welcome. Good morning, everyone. Well, Fusion is uh, operating with modified operations currently, and uh, we are working toward, first of all, our event, which is scheduled still at Dumas Bay on August 5th. Uh, we really anticipate we'll be moving toward a virtual event. We'll be making a final decision on the 25th of this month about what that's going to look like. Uh, our boutique has been closed since March 17th. Um, we are looking, hopefully, provided that our governor's plan is not extended, we're, we're looking at potential reopening on June 2nd. So we're getting prepped up with plexiglass and all the, all the things that we need, masks, gloves, um, uh, to get that going again and our fusion families are doing great. They're they're holding in place. Uh, believe it or not uh, Things have you know the fact that they're not 
afraid of being returned to homelessness and um, that their needs are met has been um, amazing. And uh, we are asking currently for grocery outlet cards. That's the one thing that they struggle with is um, their food stamps don't always cover uh, their amount of uh, food security. But in the meantime, our wonderful case manager, Stephanie Barnes, is working uh, virtually with our families. She's in touch with them several times a week. Um, our Fusion Family Center roof is almost done. We are, we are pushing through. Uh, we are hoping to, uh, still to be available at the beginning of the school year for families experiencing homelessness in federal way. And uh, the city has been amazing at helping us uh, reach our milestones. We really appreciate that. And um, all, all roads lead forward. We're staying connected with our wonderful volunteers. Uh, we've set up a Fusion Forum, forum on Wednesdays, so we all connect in that way and um, just increasing communications all the way around. Our donors have really stepped up. It's interesting. I attended a training yesterday and uh, apparently, you know, 40% of nonprofits have increased their communications and of that 40%, 50% are doing fundraising activities and they're reporting also that their donors have really stepped up. So this is great news. And um, I feel, you know, despite the challenges that we've had, we've, we've really been able to, to um, keep operations going behind the scene and uh, it's been great. Great. All right. Well, welcome. All right. Uh, Ross Baker of Virginia Mason. Thank you, Mayor. Um, my name is Ross Baker. I'm the Public Policy Director at Virginia Mason um, for both the hospital and the system here in the Puget Sound area as well, current interim on basis for our Yakima uh, Hospital, formerly Yakima Valley Memorial Hospital, which is now called Virginia Mason Memorial for the last five years. Uh, Virginia Mason has had to, uh, as all organizations on this call, has had to uh, re pivot and uh, get our operations together in order to uh, address COVID patients. We've had a significant number of COVID patients in our Yakima hospital, some of whom have been transferred to the Seattle hospital in order to receive better care. Um, probably very similar to you, we've experienced uh, approximately 40% de decrease in our revenues that has required us to cut salaries, to put non-physician, non-nurse staff on furloughs. Um, fortunately, <coughs> with a um, uh, clarification from the governor's office and some work on behalf by the hospital association, we are starting next week to uh, be able to bring patients in for regular care, for uh, starting to schedule non-urgent uh, surgeries. And uh, while we have had to consolidate some of our clinics, uh, including as I uh, recall, having some of our regional clinics uh, focus, uh, close, and then uh, have care delivered at Federal Way, in the next two weeks, we will see all of Virginia Mason's local nine clinics coming back online on a daily basis, and uh, you'll see uh, patient care beyond COVID and um, urgent surgery care being delivered. And so that will be a, a benefit, I believe, to the uh, Federal Way community. Um, lastly, uh, I can't remember what I was gonna say. Anyway, so uh, good to be here. Thank you, Mayor, for including us. Um, and you'll you'll start to see some um, social media, newspaper, and other media coverage about the fact that uh, these hospitals are safe. Uh, please go see your doctor. Don't delay care. Uh, it's important for people to receive care. Oh, I know what I was going to say. And fortunately, because of the actions of the government and governor and organizations such as yours, we, we were fortunate, as I think people know, that we did not see the numbers of COVID cases that uh, had looked like was going to occur in late February. And so it's been a benefit to the community. However, it has meant that uh, healthcare uh, providers have taken a, a large financial hit and it'll be a long time, just like many other industries before we dig out from it. Thank you. All right, thanks Ross. All right, um, see we've got, um, one second. Oh, one second. I had it. Um, 
Linda Persia. Hi, uh, it's nice to see everybody. Uh, I am the current president of Seroptimus, and we are meeting twice monthly on Zoom. And like many others, we had to cancel our one and only fundraiser, but we've mm -hmm. been very fortunate. We had a small virtual auction and made a little bit of money, but we didn't have to spend a whole lot before we canceled our luncheon. So we are sitting pretty good and uh, are ready to help the women and girls in Federal Way. And we were able to give two women uh, a total of $3,000 to help them with their schooling. One young lady is uh, EMT and works in the emergency room at Good Sam in Puyallup and has like an 18 month old. The other lady is also going into pediatric nursing and has a one year at home. So we feel very fortunate that we can help the women and girls in our community. So don't forget us, we're still, we're still here. So thank you for having me, I appreciate it. Excellent, all right, thank you. All right, Renee Ewing, the symphony. Good afternoon, I'm Renee Ewing and I'm on the symphony board and I'm, hi Randy. We are um, going through shock, I should say, as an organization. We had to have both of our concerts this spring canceled. Our fundraising uh, gala we have postponed now to August 8th with our fingers crossed. We're also preparing to do that online if we have to. Uh, we'll know by the end of this month whether to do that. We're going to take the music. When you put on a concert, I mean, you don't know, probably know this, it costs twenty to $30,000 for us to put on a concert because all our musicians are paid. They're contractors. So they keep coming back for us all the time. And they already have the music they had for April. That music costs about $3,000 just to have the music. So we're gonna to try to put that concert on in October. And Jim, we're having our fingers crossed and double crossed that we, the pack will be open in some form or other for that October 3rd concert. And if not, we'll go back to the drawing board. Uh, right now, we did receive some funding from the Arts Fund, which was a wonderful gift that has helped us to get through this because our income from the concerts was gone, our income from the gala is gone, and we don't get paid <clears throat> from our grants until we put on a program. So I think we're looking going forward, we're gonna be better off in the long run when we're done, but right now it's kind of feels weird. <laughs> That's all I say, it just feels weird. And, and we're yeah, all yeah. used to Zoom meetings, so we're there. Right, Thank you, Jim, exactly. Very <laughs> Thank you. Now I saw Lamont Styles. Uh, Lamont, are you still on the call? Mayor. Oh, very good. I, you want to introduce yourself and, and uh, what you're up to in the community? Uh, yes, I'm Lamont Stiles, um, one of the uh, founders of the Black Federal Way Black Collective. Um, also an entrepreneur in the community, just a community um, organizer in general. Um, basically, we're just we're just trying to deal with with um, um, what we've been doing as far as like trying to get resources for people of color in the community as far as um, information, there's a lot of uh, uh, um, worry about losing businesses from yeah. just from an entrepreneur. I'm a barber as well, so I know a lot of barber shops that um, have been um, worried that they've, they haven't been able to um, uh, work, but they still have to pay rent or whatever. But, um, but yeah, just from that standpoint, we're, we, uh, we still do our Thursday Thoughts show. We, um, are just looking to partner because we know once um, this uh, dies down, there's going to be a lot of things that we're going to have to deal with. So, um, yeah, we're just look, just trying to uh, maintain and figure out uh, what's going to be the, the next best move and where we can help out uh, with Federal Way. Very good. Thank you so much. Okay, Michael Park. Hi, Mayor. Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, I'd like to post some couple of issues uh, regarding Korean School Federal Way. Uh, since March 7, uh, Korean School operating Saturday June class meeting uh, and to uh, June 6th, first Saturday June. That's the, the, the school year. So we are providing Korean language classes every Saturday uh, through the June classes. 
of about 300 students. So we are going to communicate with Dr. Campbell regarding 2020 and 21 next school year, uh, how to uh, uh, plan the next years. In terms of the Korean American community in this region, uh, uh, we are having the Zoom meeting every Thursday evening, uh, the, all the Korean community leader get together <clears throat> to help each other such a un unprecedented uh, crisis. So uh, fortunately, a local Unibank uh, donated $50,000 and the community member uh, donated, we raised about over $80,000 so far to help out the needy Korean American people. And on top of that, and Korean community, we just last week donated 500 masks to Federal Police, Auburn Police, and Lakewood Police, and Linwood Police, <laughs> which uh, located uh, heavily populated Korean American. So we're trying to work together and overcome this crisis. Thank Very you. Good. Thank, thank you, sir. We got mm -hmm. two former mayors on here. We've got uh, Michael Park and, and Mary Gates. So it's it's great. Uh, before we get to uh, uh, former Mayor Gates, uh, uh, Katie, is it Katie Cruz with um, Village Green? Katie Krause. Yes. Hi, Katie Krause, sales director at Village Green Retirement Campus. We're part of the Powell Communities, which is a lo locally owned here. Um, there's two parts to our business. One, uh, how to keep the current residents here safe, happy, healthy, content, and how to um, restart what we do best, which is the social aspect of senior living. Um, so how to get that going again safely and when is the appropriate time. A lot of people missing their families, of course. Um, the real superstars here are a lot of students from Todd Beamer uh, in our dining department, going door to door <laughs> several times a day um, with meals, snacks, fun stuff to do. Uh, and then the second part is new business, uh, recruiting new um, residents to our community. How are we gonna do that? We have started virtual tours. Those are going successful for those who do have um, the um, ability to do so, whether they're on an iPhone or with a family member already. Um, so just how to open our campus safely again. And we're looking forward to when we can do that. But so far, everything is all in well here at Village Green, considering we are one of the most vulnerable populations. Right, all right, thank you, Katie. All right, uh, Mary Gates with the uh, Federal Way. Um, uh, arts, performing arts. Oh, you're, uh, you're still on, on uh, mute. Federal Way Performing Arts. Mute, uh, unmute. Okay, you can unmute her. Okay, there you go, Mary. Thanks. Oh, I see it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I am uh, president of the Federal Way Performing Arts Foundation. And of course, uh, that, that works with the Performing Arts and Events Center, but also works heavily with Tammy in the schools. And right. so uh, we're part of what all of us seem to be a part of, which is why it's great to have this community task force, Jim. And that is that we really don't ever, any of us stand alone, that we are really so intertwined. And until we know what the schools are doing, the Performing Arts Foundation has a position, <clears throat> can't really do a lot with the money that we kept from canceled uh, events this spring. But uh, we have, for the first time, because we're a fairly new organization, uh, done Give Big. Uh, we also have received one of our first grants that we've applied for. And uh, we are not 
probably not scheduled for our September 12th event, which is the fundraiser for the uh, Arts for Youth program. But uh, we have added two board members in the process of uh, people having a chance to breathe and realize they value certain items like the performing arts. And believe me, if any of you have not watched a movie or listened to some music or something like that, uh, while all of us have kind of stayed home, uh, then you really probably have not an appreciation for the arts. But without the arts, this stay at home thing would have been even oh. more painful. So we're not fe yeah. feeding people. I understand you have to, and I'm a Rotarian, and I definitely vote for the money that Rotary has given to the feeding program. But we also have to recognize we have to feed the soul. And that may be the way we keep everybody centered. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, Terry Free with Boys and Girls Club. Welcome. Hi, everybody. Um, hope you guys are doing all right. Uh, I am the operations director, uh, Mary director over the Boys and Girls Club here at 8th Avenue and here at the Teen Center. Um, the 8th Avenue Club um, and BGCKC and BGC. Um, uh, BGCA overall, um, we decided to keep um, become essential um, programs and we've been open ever since. Um, the teen center was closed for a little bit um, and it just recently opened back up for virtual learning once Federal Way Public Schools made their announcements and all the school districts were mandated to continue virtual learning. At this current time, um, I did, you know, I notified uh, Federal Way Public Schools and, and got in touch with um, um, all the powers that be that needed to have all the information. We offer two virtual learning sessions. We uh, we take care of social distancing. We screen students. They have to sign up. Um, it's Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. is the first session, and then 12.30 to 3.30. And in between each time, we just, we require um, all students that sign up that they bring their um, schedules with them and their homework. And once they're done, then their parents can pick them up. So it's not something where they hang out. It's strictly virtual learning to assist uh, those who are in need of either internet, um, internet, Wi-Fi, and or uh, laptops and um, any kind of uh, uh, computers, things like that, so that they can finish their um, schoolwork. Um, that's what's going on at the Teen Center. Here at uh, Federal Way 8, uh, we did, um, we have been taking in essential uh, employee children um, Monday through Friday. Um, and at no charge in order to assist them. And because we know that it's, uh, you know, pretty financially difficult at this time. Um, and we constantly have about 20 kids every day uh, for essential. Um, and additionally, in order to help our community as a whole, um, we do every Thursday, we, we partnered with, um, GS, uh, YO, and um, uh, BBB, and we have a food, um, we provide, uh, they set up food uh, stations and the community is able to come and drive through and pick up groceries um, every Thursday from um, 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, so here at the 8th Avenue Club. Um, and that's kind of what we have been doing in order to assist our community and be available um, this summer. Um, hoping in regards to our summer camps at both sites, um, obviously we have to make some changes due to CDC and DOH um, screening and, and uh, regulations. Um, but again, we, we are abiding by those. Um, uh, providing masks and screening and things like that. But uh, I think right now, the most important part for us, especially up at the teen center is providing the uh, ability for those who need it 
um, those middle school and high school kids the ability to um, meet with their teachers, get some homework done, uh, provide, you know, Wi-Fi and things like that so that going into fall once uh, school districts figure out and the education system figure out what's going to happen, um, right. nobody, you know, they'll be up to date and, and <clears throat> just to swing in. And then again, um, providing as much um, things that we can for items that we can, whether it's groceries or childcare for our essential workers and our community. Thank you, Terry. All right, Angela Baylor, center stage. Hello, you thank you. Um, thanks so much, Mayor, for including center stage in this. Um, I, I can't be more eloquent than Mary Gates was as far as her comments about the arts. And so thank you, Mary, for your words, and I'm just going to piggyback on what you said. Um, so obviously, we uh, had to cancel our last two shows of the season, which is, uh, is tough. Um, that, that resulted in about a $35,000 loss in income. Mm. So um, we had to move our fundraiser. We are doing a, um, like everybody else, um, we are going into the virtual world. So we are um, having our virtual event on June 20th. Uh, hmm. and we're, we're doing it for a full week. So we kick off on the 20th and we wrap up on the 27th. So um, we're hoping to, uh, we've got a really uh, healthy goal of 35,000, but that would ensure if we're able to uh, perform in October, um, that will ensure that we will continue. It's, you know, it's rather, it's rather dire. Um, we have, the board has been working on contingency plans from life as usual to not starting the season until June or January um, to not even be able to have a season. So um, that's obviously not our choice. Uh, we're kind of treating this as our downtime um, to do some strategic planning. One of the things that we're really working on is uh, figuring out how to build our audiences, but also how to uh, increase our diversity. That's a real um, thing that is on our hearts as leadership in the arts community. And uh, so we're working on different things like that, not only diversity on our stage, which we're working, you know, we've been pretty successful with, but also in our audiences. Um, we're also embarking on um, accessibility programs for those with disabilities to kind of break down the barriers, not only physical disabilities, but also neuroatypical, neurodiverse uh, disabilities as well. So we're excited, we're fortunate to have uh, the artistic director of the National Disability Theater partnering with us. Um, so that's kind of what we're using our downtime just to figure out how this new normal is. And obviously, theater and the arts are um, very much a live experience. So we are trying to figure out how we can bring that to everyone and work within the whole social and physical distancing and um, yet still feed, feed the community's soul. So. Um, Thank you for the seat, the invitation to the seat at the table. We appreciate it, and we hope to hope to be able to partner with a lot of the a lot of the people on here because I think that we can really make this this community stronger through all of us together. So we're excited to to see what happens after this. Thank you, Angela. All right, and we've also got uh, Dr. John Mosby with the Highline. <clears throat> So uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm John Mosby, president of Highline College. It is great to see all of you, and it's nice that I actually recognize many of you. So uh, I've lived here a little, um, be two years in July 1, so uh, getting to recognize people um, it makes me smile. Um, I, I just want to briefly uh, give an update. Um, uh, I'm going to appreciate the fact of having um, kind of an email chain list um, coming out after this because I, I'm more than happy to send you all the link to our Highland College cor uh, coronavirus webpage, which has all my correspondence to the campus community, videos, um, video messages, uh, information about various resources, connections for HR. So basically kind of your, your one location that our campus community is getting directed to. Um, um, and for assistance. Uh, quickly, um, our summer um, quarter will be pretty much remote teaching, um, continuing what we're doing now. And fall quarter, uh, we made the decision about three weeks ago um, to have a couple different modalities that people um, 
well, we'll say can choose from, but really will be basically on the directive of the governor. So we're really looking at virtual and hybrid, virtual and online uh, course offerings. Our hope is to be back, but we know that the reality, that, that's, a, that's a tall order. Um, and with a campus of 9,000 folks, um, it becomes a playground for COVID spreading that. Right. So we be mindful of that. Um, but I will make sure this information gets sent to you um, that has what we're doing for our academics and our service delivery for summer and for fall. But I do want to highlight, and I'll close with this, um, one, thank you again, Amir Farrell, for that invitation. I greatly appreciate it. So does our college. Uh, second of all, I know you've heard a lot of information about CARES Act and CARES funding. Highline College received a little over three and a half million dollars for care funding, half of which goes directly to the students. And while I'm very thankful and never want to look a gift horse in the mouth by any means, um, there are some communities that aren't eligible for this funding. Um, and um, some of our most vulnerable of vulnerable communities are not eligible. So we're making sure to identify funding opportunities uh, to be able to assist those students. <clears throat> so we opened up the application this week and in less than 24 hours we had, um, I think the last count I got about an hour ago was a, a couple under 900 application hmm. hours. So wow. it really speaks to um, the, the, the need of students and their assistance and uh, we will do our best to uh, accommodate and serve <clears throat> those students in um, as much as we can. And I think the last thing I will say is what we did find out, and uh, you know, that was a little surprising, but it just shows the reality is, as we try to make sure that our students are served to the highest level possible, pandemic or not, um, we recognize that you know, our students don't always have the resources, right? They don't have the technology resources at home, sometimes don't have internet, computers. But we also found out um, that's been very challenging for our staff and faculty. Many of those individuals do not have the technology and resources. So how do we model this success for our students and getting them to their finish line when our staff and faculty are struggling? So we are working on that end. Um, to really assist them in really trying to move forward and our whole community being served. Thanks again for letting me be here. I appreciate it. Thank you, doctor. And thank you for your partnership with uh, your continued partnership in uh, trying to get a, a satellite uh, a campus and the negotiations going on here in Federal Way. So thank, thank you. you. Appreciate it. Okay. And now we've got uh, Krista Christensen with um, uh, MultiCare. Hi. Thank you for having us all. This is a good opportunity for us to get together. Um, I have, I serve as an administrator for MultiCare. Um, we have eight hospitals across the state and about a hundred and, I don't know, 90 clinics. Um, and I also serve as um, on the board of directors for the Chamber of Commerce for Federal Way. Um, I think for healthcare, I think everybody's kind of um, highlighted a lot of the challenges. Um, you know, we responded with, you know, standing up virtual care, doing all the things that I think all of our other care um, partners have done, the amount of partnership and collaboration across all the healthcare systems to re, um, support our communities was fantastic. Um, I think going forward, the concern that I have that I hope we address at some point is um, our communities are not getting the healthcare that they receive and they're not accessing our ER volumes. And this is not just us, it's most are down 40 to 60% um, urgent care. and what concerns me about that, and we all want to get elective surgeries going and all of that other stuff is by the time patients hit our door for strokes and heart attacks, it's too late. Um, so I think messaging around essential health care is really important because if our communities aren't healthy, they can't work, they can't get back to supporting our economy. So that's probably my biggest concern is um, having ensure that our communities are getting the health care they need. Very good. Thank you. Okay, uh, we've got uh, we've got to uh, uh, get through the rest of the uh, um, introductions here pretty quickly because we need to move on. But <clears throat> is there anybody else? Um, uh, Shelly Pure, uh, are you uh, are you in the line? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Oh, great. Yes. yes. Okay. Can you just briefly introduce yourself and your organization. 
Sure, I'm with the Federal Senior Center and Food Bank and Meal Program, and we are open right now with our uh, food bank, and um, we're open for help helping people. Our staff is there uh, remotely. We're helping for outreach and helping our seniors. And uh, today we had about 75 households come through the food bank, and we're picking up food from uh, seven different grocery stores, Food Lifeline, uh, Northwest Harvest. And um, we're also delivering foods to all of our seniors. And to, so we're delivering foods to uh, how senior housing and veterans housing in Federal Way, the day center, uh, churches. And um, we've got a lot of volunteers helping us. And we also wanna thank uh, the city of Federal Way for the funding to help us stay open and to continue this. Great. Thank you very much. Actually, uh, Robin Korak, I don't think we've called on you. Robin with Multi-Service Center. Yeah. Hi, so Robin Korak, um, CEO for the Multi-Service Center. Thank you for inviting us. Um, we, our offices are closed right now, but we're still providing services remotely and online with the exception of the food bank, which is still in person. <clears throat> but we've changed the services there to um, reduce risk to our customers' employees. Um, we've seen a lot of new families who've never needed services before, and thanks to the City of Federal Way and, and other community members, we've been able to step up and meet some of that need. Um, and we anticipate a huge need for rental assistance. Um, but Very good. Okay. And uh, we've got uh, Council President Honda and Council Member uh, Lydia Sefadasan, I believe. Council Member Honda, you, excuse me, Council President Honda, are you still here? Yes. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for joining today, and um, it, it's been interesting listening to what everyone is still doing, keeping busy and helping the community. We really appreciate that. Great. Thank you very much. And uh, Council Member Lydia Sefadasan? Oops. Hi, everyone. Um, it's good to be here. Thank you for everything you're doing for our community. Uh, really appreciate you. and. Um, Love the partnership, and um, I'm I'm really grateful that I could join on this meeting to really hear what everybody's doing. So you're totally totally appreciated, and thank you for keeping our city going in this um, compassionate and um, and caring manner. So just wanted to say thank you, and thank you, Great. Mayor, for have for having me on here. Thank you. Thank you, Lydia. Uh, we have uh, Tim Johnson who helped. Uh, 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 really helped with the uh, business resiliency task force meeting yesterday, and he's helped with this as well. Um, I, we've got uh, uh, Bill Vadino here in my office, Tyler Hemstreet, uh, our IT uh, person, uh, our IT director, uh, Thomas. Uh, we also have some interns, uh, Maya Steven and Ben Bowman. Uh, thank you for uh, your, uh, their interns in the economic development um, uh, department of our city. So is there anybody on the phone who has not yet introduced themselves? Oh, we've got Sarah Bridgeford with, uh, uh, she's our human services manager. We're going to have her talk in a few minutes. Um, okay, I think we're good uh, to, uh, I, we have a lot of people on this task force, and uh, I wanted to make sure that everybody knew who they were and had a chance to talk uh, a little bit about um, your organizations and the, and the current uh, state of, of where we're at right now. I would say that the purpose of this organization right now, that this task force, is very limited uh, a purpose. Number one is a clearinghouse to make sure that the key organizations and, and portions of our community um, have continuity, that we have uh, free flow of uh, communication, that we are uh, you know, making sure that we understand where the needs are, where the deficits are, um, and how uh, we're all getting through this. I think the, the key part of this is informational. In a few minutes, we're gonna do a PowerPoint presentation and I'm <clears throat> going to bring you up to speed on what we've done so far and in really about where we're going. Um, the second meeting, well, which we're hoping to have on uh, Thursday, June 4th, will really focus on uh, strategies. Um, I would say immediately after this meeting, you're all going to be receiving a questionnaire that uh, will be able to gauge uh, you know, key, you know, really get into the details a little bit. We're going to be able to break that down. And then we're going to talk about uh, service delivery and needs in our community at that second meeting. I think that the most we're looking at really is about 10 hours at the most. Uh, we're going to try to keep this meeting to a little over one hour today. Maybe we'll have to go over because we took some time on the introductions. 
So uh, with that, I, I think, um, you know, um, three meetings, definitely, uh, possibly a fourth. Uh, but we're, again, we're going to be res respectful of your time. What we're going to be also doing in the uh, in the times uh, time periods between the meetings is make sure we push out information and then really utilize that as an opportunity for you to as a as a platform to share information with your groups as well. Okay, so with that, uh, let's go ahead and get the uh, uh, Bill's going to help me with the uh, PowerPoint. They don't trust me to run the PowerPoint myself, so thank goodness we've got good IT people and and uh, Bill on hand. Okay, so. Um, so this is what we've done so far. I just want to emphasize, you know, I want to make sure that when we're having, having these discussions that it's centered on the best information possible and to let you know, and maybe you could share as well uh, what's been done so far. <clears throat> before, we got, uh, before we go any further, I want to say thank you so much to our healthcare workers and first responders, the staffs at our grocery stores and food and other essential businesses, community organizations like yours, uh, and our educators, and the City of Federal Way staff. It's just done a phenomenal job. Um, I think it is important, you know, we're starting to start get a little pushback uh, from people that are, you know, either getting cabin fever or concerned about uh, the four phases and whether they are going to be moving along. But I think it is important that we follow the public health directions and ensure a quick, quick and speedy resolution. And uh, we also want to stay, you know, economically engaged to make sure that we protect the jobs that we have in our community. So this is what we've done so far. At the State of the City Address, which, gosh, doesn't that seem like a long time ago now on February 27th, we uh, talked about this very briefly, and then we had that February 29th meeting about how residents could prepare. We had the emergency proclamation on March 9th. <clears throat> also on that date was the standing up of the uh, internal group of the Outbreak Advisory um, Team, the OAT, um, and that's internal to the city, but we've also been running uh, Greater Federal Way Emergency Operations Center meetings. In fact, at 1.30 today, immediately following this meeting, we'll have yet another one of those meetings that involves the local governments and organizations. We held a, um, a meeting, a, a Zoom meeting with the faith-based groups uh, on April 14th. Uh, we closed City Hall. It was something I did not want to do, but we, you know, um, we had to uh, shut the front door, but we actually have been keeping operations running with regard to our internal operations, but in regard to the general public, uh, that we had to close the front door. City operations, as I said, remain open, um, and we're alternating in person and remote work. And everybody who can work from home is doing so. Um, and with, there's been actually a great deal of electronic mail um, uh, staff uh, business. In fact, actually, uh, our community development director said that our uh, output um, with regard to permits and, and things going on in community development, that that is actually at a pre-COVID levels. <clears throat> we uh, had to close the community center, Dumas Space Center and the Performing Arts and Center, and those remain closed. And it shows that the pack were being uh, rescheduled. Um, we thought it was important to keep our parks open and as long as the social distancing remained, and, uh, and that has been successful. But to ensure that, we had to close our picnic shelters, playgrounds, fields, and sport courts. Um, we issued an emergency proclamation aimed at uh, uh, putting a freeze on late fees uh, for uh, by landlords on renters um, and because we wanted to make sure that people, once they got through this process, were actually able, uh, did not have an overwhelming debt, um, you know, past that. The first phase of, of uh, <clears throat> financial support was $15,000 to our local food bank at the multi-service center and um, uh, the multi-service center um, has seen a significant increase in families visiting the food bank, uh, but with that actually um, uh, was increased as well. We actually um, did another allocation. I think our total allocation toward uh, humanitarian uh, support uh, went to about 88,500 allocated so far and up to a total of 300,000. Uh, we're authorizing the use of Federal Way Parks personnel to deliver food to the food banks and, uh, and they've been playing a role in the distribution. Well, we allocated $12,000 to Catholic Community Services for extended day center hours, thank you to them. And we've allocated um, uh, that another 13,500 for uh, CCS to expand reach out uh, shelter through April. As I said, the, the council, thank you uh, uh, council for your support of up to $300,000 to ensure that we're doing to uh, help out with basic needs. <clears throat> 
with the support of uh, Tim Johnson, we've uh, been rolling out Prosperity Beckons, which is really uh, support for businesses and nonprofits and, and uh, the idea that coming together uh, in our community. And while we, while we may not have actually, one of our council members came up with this great quote, and I don't know where he heard it, but council member Copang said, while we may not be in the same boat, we're all in the same storm. And I thought that was a great analogy and kind of where we're at right now. And so we're all in this together and working to make sure that, you know, that um, not just the business community, but all aspects of our community uh, remain up and running. So really three point focus resolution of the, of the virus and making sure that we're doing our part there, the recovery and reopening of the city's economy and businesses and making sure that there's resilience or bounce back. <clears throat> To do that and to that end, we've been de de uh, deploying a seven point, uh, seven point strategy on that and I'll just run through that pretty quickly. Uh, number one, public outreach, and that's really what we're doing now, but working with our community partners, partners, ensuring constant, consistent communications to nonprofits, businesses, property owners, commercial and residential, and regional stakeholders. And this is an ongoing uh, uh, process. Technical assistance and the support of nonprofits, the city will coordinate with other public agencies and organizations to provide technical assistance to nonprofits on government assistance programs. We're gonna talk a little bit about that when I, I'm gonna have Sarah talk in here in a few minutes, but the, to the degree which we can assist, we will. And uh, making sure that we're getting that information out and collaborating on that. Clearinghouse and opportunities. A variety of research is being done uh, internally and. Uh, uh, for you know, to understand the dynamics of the cities and the region's marketplaces by sector and unemployment rates. Uh, you know, one of the things you're gonna get ex uh, starting now is the memorandum uh, that Tim Johnson puts out weekly in regard to market trends and what's happening. <clears throat> and we hope that's gonna be a, a benefit to you. Number four, legislative and regulatory affairs. Uh, we actually, the, uh, we actually were supposed to actually, uh, today was our, uh, weekly meeting or bi-weekly meeting with our state legislators um, and we are going to an every other week that got moved to next week with regard to our state legislators but we're also earlier this week I met uh, uh, via zoom with our congressman uh, Adam Smith and uh, I talk uh, pretty regularly with our King County Council person uh, King, uh, King County Council member Pete von Reichbauer and they have actually just uh, approved 60 million dollars in funding uh, for the community, for a variety of, of services. And we're gonna be uh, talking about that. And, and I'll have Sarah talk about that and what's, what's looming there, but also CARES Act uh, money. Cooperation, both interagency um, within the city and interagency um, uh, with the city, regional, state, and national agencies. And that's what I was talking about, making sure that we're all uh, working in concert. We had this, obviously, this is a key piece of that, the Community Continuity Task Force, and I've explained that. And then what occurred yesterday, and which will be ongoing as well, is a Business Resiliency Task Force. So obviously the entire uh, effort so far has been to flatten the curve, uh, helping our neighbors, supporting our local pro um, nonprofits. Um, we wanna make sure that we're doing everything we can, and we all know um, those steps. And I would just say that, you know, a tonomia is tonoma, uh, an eternal optimist, and, uh, and and I love this Winston Churchill quote that an optimist sees opportunity in every difficulty. So um, before we get to um, uh, questions on that, let's uh, on the presentation so far and what actions have been taken. Uh, Sarah, can you um, can you chime in here, and maybe we go uh, off of the uh, there we go. Uh, Sarah, can you talk about opportunities that are available for uh, that are either ongoing or um, uh, uh, looming uh, with regard to funding uh, for our nonprofits and our faith-based groups and, and uh, the community. Thank you, Mayor Farrell. I would be happy to. And, and please let me know if I miss anything. Um, I know that you referenced me a couple times in the presentation, <laughs> and I have to be very honest that uh, I was also getting some communication from um, HUD about our CDBG allocation. Oh, very good. Uh, uh, very good and, and also changing as everybody on this call can probably understand uh, information is, is changing so quickly that our process looks like it might also uh, change and we have a, a tight time frame on that. Um, but that is one of the things that the city is doing is trying to identify um, some of the, the biggest needs that we're able to address with funding that we have available. 
that includes the community development block grant program where we did receive an additional allocation of four hundred thirty two thousand six hundred twenty two dollars um, those funds will be allocated by the Human Service Commission through a competitive application that has closed. Um, and then some of the funding that the city had allocated earlier will also uh, be funded through CDBG. Um, we're looking at some unique gaps that have been occurring. One that is, uh, I, I think, the most concerning and that has come up on this call is the rent cliff. So what happens when the eviction moratorium ends and people owe past due rent. Um, even if there's a payment plan in place, it will likely exceed the financial capacity of many of our households and, and residents in federal way. Um, so that is of great concern and something that we're looking at um, providing resource through CDBG and maybe through other sources as well. Um, additionally, the technology gap and looking at um, households that don't have broadband wiring. That may seem odd, but with CDBG, uh, we actually have a focus on broadband and have had to start tracking it with this current consolidated plan in 2020. Um, so we may be able to utilize our home repair program. It's a hard program to mobilize for that, but I think that we might have a, a path forward to support both students as well as people who are now working remotely and, and don't have adequate technology access. Um, as Mayor Farrell mentioned, we are looking for other funding sources, whether that's through the, the CARES Act and funding that will be available to the city. We're waiting for guidance on that. As that becomes available, we'll, we'll know more and share that with the community and the, the entities on this call. Uh, similarly, we might also be receiving additional CDBG funds that we would uh, be using to support residents. Yeah, in fact, we got a $2.9 million allocation for CARES Act money. Uh, but can you talk about, uh, Sarah, the limitation of that money and what we're, what we're thinking about using it for? Um, I, so I know very little about the social service side with the CARES Act, and they're supposed to be releasing more guidance at the state level on um, what that looks like, uh, policies that are going to be in place to regulate it. Are there any parameters that we're not aware of? So we haven't moved forward with CARES Act funding for social services until we have more guidance. Right, and we're waiting on that from the State Department of Commerce. It is interesting that, you know, obviously the CARES Act came from the federal government. They, you know, our allocation is a healthy one at 2.9, but we can't use it for lost revenue. We can't use it for things that are non-budgeted. Um, and we actually can't allocate any money until we get the, the regulations as prom promulgated by the State Department of Commerce. So while we know that money is there, we are in a holding pattern for that. So thank you, Sarah, for that detailed uh, approach. And in fact, actually, uh, I, th I think actually for the recent allocation of uh, CDBG money, uh, those applications just closed the earlier this week. Is that right? That is correct, yes. Okay. All right, with that, um, we've done the introductions. I wanted to make sure everybody understood what kind of what we've done so far. And again, this uh, uh, application is gonna go out. Are there any questions or comments? Let me see if I can look here if there are any hands up. Hi, this is Estella Ortega. Yes, and Estella. I was wondering about the, you referred to the King County money, the $60 yes. million. Do you feel, um, have any additional information to provide there? Yes, actually, uh, let me, uh, we got an email from that. They, that was just voted on earlier this week. And let's see here. Uh, let me let me show you what we got. What we've um, so here's what here's what we know about the King County. Um, they passed a um, including the package was three million dollars that will assist small businesses in SCA cities, but it also included. Um, $500,000 for $5,000 grants to chambers of commerce and community-based organizations whose primary mission is to provide marketing, technical assistance, and other support to small business. $500,000 for $25,000 competitive grants to chambers of commerce and community-based organizations. $50,000 for administrative costs 
and remaining funds to every city allocated proportionally by population with a minimum of $10,000, except for the city of Seattle. These funds are cities to allocate to small businesses. Uh, more detail to come on this, but wanted to share the good news. This is from Deanna Dawson with SCA. So, um, uh, Bill, do you have anything to add well, in regard to? Yeah. Go yeah, ahead, can you Bill. hear me? Yeah, in, in addition, I'm looking yeah. at another uh, email they just sent us. Three million, sorry, two million to for culture to provide relief funds to arts, culture, heritage, and preservation or um, organizations. And then we'll send out the comprehensive uh, press release, but um, there are, um, a, there's all sorts of areas where like Department of Local Services, Public Health, Housing and Community Development, um, there's other things that may, uh, may apply to some of us in the community. So we'll get that out after the meeting, a summary from the press release. But they are going to do a comprehensive release uh, Friday tomorrow to tell us exactly even more detail for you all. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Great question, Estella. All right. Any other uh, questions or comments? Uh, Mary Gates. Oh, she's not muted. She's muted. Pam, can you unmute her? There we go. You're live. There we go. I'm live. Uh, the uh, federal government and Tacoma have been making a big deal, at least Tacoma has, about allocation to, quote, smaller cities. Uh, and I was really pleased to see that you're talking to Adam Smith about that. But uh, where are we in terms of dr them drawing the line? on that because obviously if Tacoma, which I'm thinking they're raising enough of a ruckus that they will, are we raising enough of a ruckus to make sure that they don't draw the line before we are considered? Um, well, the, the first piece of this is that is capturing as much of the, the, the real challenge right now with the, with the $2.9 million of CARES Act money is it's so narrowly tailored right now by, def by definition, that we can only, we only have about $100,000 of eligible re-expenses. So um, what's gonna happen to that $2.8 million? I mean, so we actually have access to these funds, but it really is going to be incumbent on uh, the State Department of Commerce to make sure that, you know, we, the, they promulgate rules that make sense for us. It would be a shame for this you know, community to have this money allocated to it, but not be able to use it. So I think actually that's what that next wave, the, the next question is whether there's going to be, uh, and I know that there's new federal legislation that's been dropped uh, at the federal level that would have at this stage, uh, pretty significant allocations to communities. Um, but um, obviously that uh, uh, there's the uh, political game to be played back in or political process uh, to be uh, conducted <laughs> um, back in the other Washington. So as they say. Uh, good question, though, but we're going to, those are the kinds of things that we want to make sure that everybody is aware of, of what's going on. And right now, we're working our way through the State Department of Commerce and making sure. The first act, the, the first CARES Act actually didn't, you know, uh, only dealt with cities larger than 500,000. Um, so that's actually where this, this current CARES Act um, uh, it should address us, but we need to make sure that the uh, the loophole, uh, the, the loopholes or the exclusions uh, don't render the don't either render the allocations meaningless, uh, and that's what we're working on. Good. But thank you. Okay, any other uh, questions or comments? Let's see if anybody's raised their hand electronically. Well, I want to say thank you. Um, this is uh, it, it's been you know very interesting and and fascinating to hear. And, and heartening to hear about the work that you're doing at, at every, each and every one of your organizations. But I think the most important thing is we keep in touch, that we just, you know, all come together. And I love that line about, well, we may be in different boats, but we're all in the same storm. Um, I got to tell Mark, uh, Susan, remind me, I got to tell Mark I used this quote a couple of times. Uh, because I think that really does signify this, this country, this region, this community is going through a storm. We're all going through it together. And I think that, that uh, the most that we can communi communicate and work our way through this one piece at a time is going to be very important. Um, so uh, we'll be, uh, we're going to send out that uh, questionnaire. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, anything Mayor? else for the good of the order? Yes, Susan. Um, I just want to let everyone know that the farmer's market is opening Saturday 
I was going to say That's tomorrow, right. but today is not Friday yet. Right. And um, the first hour from nine to 10 is for those older folks and people with compromised immunity. Um, everyone has to have a mask to go in and you need to bring your own or buy a mask from a vendor there and they'll be five dollars and uh it's one way in and one way out so it it'll be a lot different right now but it does open and we're pretty glad to see it opening it's great it's where i usually buy my my mother's day flowers and uh obviously right. we missed it by a week so uh but it's always a good time to buy flowers so uh, and and all the things there so, so thank you we'll be there um okay anything else for the good of the order you guys Okay, thank you. Stay self and safe and healthy, you guys. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Have a good day. Thank you, you, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day, Mayor. Everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.